art with a capital A only becomes art after a certain period of time. And that time is really the time needed for academics, museums, curators, the most important brains in the world that know about art to study art with a certain perspective of time. A lot of clients, collectors do have art advisors. And the only reason why they really do that is because in today's world, collectors don't have the time that they used to have back in the 19th century or early 20th century, whether you're an art advisor like me, or you're an art curator or director of a museum or an art collector to determine Mm -hmm. what that is. And once you have that and you're capable of living with all these different perspectives of realities, then your life really changes because it enhances your vision of the world. It does indeed. Hello, Inner's community. My guest today is an art advisor. He had co-founded and co-directed the first art gallery to exhibit street art in Spain. And after years of promoting emerging artists, he established a consultancy firm with operations in Madrid, New York, and recently in Dubai, specializing in advising art collectors and investors on how to fulfill their aspirations in the primary and secondary market of contemporary post-war and modern art. Cristobal Galicia, welcome to the Inners. Thank you very much, Ali. That's a great intro. It's Couldn't been have said it better. <laughs> You're most welcome. <laughs> it's been worth the wait. We've been trying to catch you yeah. in between flights. So thank yeah. you very much for taking the time and being here with us. My absolute pleasure. Always so, for a friend. Thank you. Appreciate it. Proud to be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> and now they say art is truth. Yes. Art is truth. Correct. Amazing. I would say. So it's truth, it's universal truth, I would say. Yes. Yes, Yes. it is. The reason why I would say it is universal truth is because art with a capital A only becomes art um, after a certain period of time. And that time is really the time needed for um, academics, museums, curators, the um, the most important brains in the world that know about art to study art with a certain perspective of time and be able to say, okay, this is art. This is worth coming into the museum. This is worth looking at. And you, you only, you only get that with perspective with time. And I think that time, um, that the, the sheer amount of time that is needed to have that perspective talks about, how truth, how truthful and how objective art really is. That is not to say that there's also great art that is worth being labeled as art, um, being created today, right now. It's just harder to identify how good it is because it's something that is in motion. It's being created and you still don't have that perspective, that historical perspective, which makes it much easier. Um, so that's why a lot of clients, collectors, uh, do have art advisors. And the only reason why they really do that is because in today's world, collectors don't have the time that they used to have back in the you know 19th century or early 20th century when the wealthy, the capitalist would basically be capitalist and, and have a lot of free time to go and see and travel and, and they wouldn't have that, um, time restriction that today's ultra high net worth individuals have, which basically limits their capacity to see and travel to see a lot. And that's essentially how you really get to understand where the good art or where art is for the sake of argument. So, we act a little bit as eyes on the ground for these people and we need to travel a lot to see a lot and that's how you kind of start getting an idea of where things are going and where quality might end but again it's always it's a very interesting path because 
whatever you see today, you can't really a certain to a hundred percent certainty that it will become great art. And that's, and that's a risk component that I think everybody likes in the industry. Um, collectors as well. I mean, they like that riskiness. Otherwise they wouldn't be ultra high net worth individuals. So going, getting into, um, this, this, this industry, what they try to do is kind of validate their own entrepreneurial vision through, through collecting through collecting and they try to be the ones that discover and validate those artists and kind of bring them from, you know, take them from being, you know, just up and coming emerging contemporary artists to being the finest artists of their time. And speaking of time, let's travel back in time okay. to the beginnings of your journey. Okay. So um, I wasn't originally intending to get into the art world when I was uh, finishing my business degree in London. Um, but I guess my family and my upbringing kind of pushed me in that direction. Um, so I, I was born uh, in Spain. Um, and at the time when I was born, my father was trying to become a respected artist. He was a hyper-realist artist. He was inspired by some of the greatest old masters from Spain and uh, Flemish art, so uh, Goya, Velasquez, Rembrandt. So he was trying to kind of, um, he was taking from that great legacy that we have in, in European art and mixing it with... Um, American photorealism, so Richard Estes, and kind of take it to the next level and doing basically painting photos, essentially, but photos that were better than photos that were going beyond the photo. And to do that, to do that, you basically have to, um, you know, it's, it's a very complex way of uh, constructing a painting because you need a lot of layers in order to build the, the air, the, 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 the space, um, the light that you need to get that kind of impact. Um, so my father was doing that back in the days, back in the early, uh, 80s. Um, he was investigating a lot with another two artists at the time who were at the frontier of between painting and photography and trying to see how they could, um, break that frontier and, and, and come up with a new discovery, which they kind of did because I haven't seen anything like that in, recent 40 years. Um, but anyway, funny enough, despite the legacy of old masters, Spanish art, my father, when he would go to talk to art galleries in Spain, uh, the, one of the first reactions that he received from all these dealers was, well, it's nice, but what did you study? You know, what, what's your degree? And my father, he was a terrible, terrible student. He started law. He didn't finish art law. He then went to do um, uh, fine art and he didn't finish fine art because he felt it was uh, what he was learning was not good enough for what he would, what he wanted to create. And so uh, when he, when he gave his CV to all these people, all these dealers, some of which ended up becoming really important in Spain and European wise, I would say, um, they all told him to go back to law school, Gosh. which was extremely frustrating, uh, for somebody who was painting that well, because honestly he was doing some great work at the time. He still is by the way, but what he was doing then, it was incredible. So funny enough, um, the story was, uh, my father had his, uh, first master work um, uh, stored in my grandfather's wool, um, business trading business in the, in central Madrid. And one day, um, after having spoken with, um, an important patron, Spanish patron at the time, whose wife was, um, American and loved art, uh, they decided to go and see the artwork. And so you understand where, you know, how the situation was with my father back then. My grandfather had the work stored in, at the end 
of the warehouse mm. covered in 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 sheets because he was he he wasn't really proud of what my father was doing at the time and so there was an amazing discovery because when the collectors when these patrons came in um my grandfather kind of gave him the the, the waiver you know and say well listen i'm going to uncover this but you know I'm, I'm sorry it's it's what my kid has decided to do and <laughs> this is what it is ah. so they were they were incredibly surprised when they saw the painting because it was stunning it was a stunning work and that um helped that was that was the moment where these patrons said well listen i mean you can't be going through all of this you're not being recognized as you should you have to go to new york and we'll help you and your wife and your kid um you know get there and so my father um he was introduced to um a dealer in new york who started seeing his work he thought it was amazing and my father went from trying to sell an artwork for six thousand year uh six thousand dollars at the time, which he couldn't sell in a whole year, to selling it for thirty five thousand within a week in New York. So that was that was when he came to realize that, you know, the market wasn't in Spain, it was in it was in New York. And um so we we all went to New York in the eighties. Uh that's where I grew up. Um, but funny enough, you know, for me, growing up in the late eighties, nineties in New York was, which was an incredible place to, to, to live in at the time, because bear in mind that basket with it was there, you know, basket was, had, 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 was being discovered in the early eighties. Uh, Warhol was chasing, uh, basket because he thought it was the next big thing. Um, there was a whole group of incredible artists. There was Julian Schnabel was there as well. You know, there was the neo-expressionist. There was the, there was also the postmodern contemporary artist, more, more conceptual, like Jeff Koons was also starting there. Um, Barbara Kruger, Robert Longo, I don't know, like a, a, a group of very, very interesting artists who have essentially really determined uh, the path of contemporary art for the past 40 years. So, so my father was, was there then. But his discipline was far from modernism because it's more anti-modernism, or at least at the time. Why? Because if there's something that um, uh, postmodernism was uh, fighting was uh, traditional uh, paint, uh, traditional representation, figuration. So, you know, my father was essentially doing that. He was representing. He was representing just like the old masters did before the camera was invented. Whereas all these postmodernist artists, contemporary from the time, they were essentially moving forward and moving away from representation and going to non-representational abstraction, conceptualism, et cetera, et cetera. So my father was in that realm, but he was kind of, he was in a niche, in a niche that was a contrarian niche, let's sort of say. Um, but he found his, his place, his spot. And um, one of the things that we, that uh, kind of sucked in at the time with his work was, uh, first of all, it was incredible. There was, there was really anything, there wasn't really anything that could go beyond um, the representational capacity that he had because this hyperrealism was incredible. So when you're growing up as a kid, you tend to um, focus on what you're able to see instead of what you're not able to see because that's essentially how we're educated. So growing up in that house, that in that household, um, I I thought that there wasn't really a better artist than my father because I thought, you know, well, after making a photo better than a photo, how can you, you know? That being said, um, my father had this incredible influence as well on on street art and graffiti. Uh, my father and mother, I mean, they they both had this. Um, for some reason, they loved the street. I mean, back in the days in New York, it was a, a really interesting place to be in the street. You know, there was, you know, downtown Soho, um, that that area. I remember it perfectly because that's where we would go to buy, um, for my father to buy paint supplies mm -hmm. um, to Pearl in, in Soho. Um, that was an incredible place. And it was, uh, it, it was really vibrant because you could feel... There were all these artists that were growing. Um, there were top models walking around the streets. I remember bumping into Claudia Schiffer and, you know, and, and seeing all these people, which, you know, at the time you could only see in like magazines. You, you didn't have that. 
viral um, effect on on all these super um, talented and 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 uh, famous people. But and so because of that, they were they were there and and they were much more approachable. And we would anyway. Um, I grew up in that New York, which was an incredible New York, an incredible yeah. time. Uh, and then that was pretty much it for me in, in, in terms of New York. Uh, I, we left, uh, 96, 97, uh, 98. I can't recall exactly which year, but yeah, 97, I think it was. And, um, anyway, went uh, back to Madrid, uh, continued my, um, my life there until I did business, uh, ended up business, wanted to do something on my own after four years of doing business, just because I didn't believe in the corporate world, wanted to have, um, uh, my, an imprint in my own career. I want to be in control of my own career instead of, you know, being just, a. uh, how could I say this? I don't know. But anyway, as I was getting into the professional world, my mother, uh, was considering f- opening an art gallery and in she had, in Madrid and yeah. she had a cl- very clear idea of what she wanted to do. Um, she wanted to do something involving street art again, because of that, all that, um, experience in the streets of New York and seeing, uh, how art was essentially being created or at least coming to fruition in New York at mm-hmm. the time. So my mother thought there was something there and she gave me this explanation. She said, this is what I'm doing. I thought, oh, well, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from because I saw the exact same thing. So she wanted me to help her from the, on the business side of the, the, the business. I mean, the administrator, yeah. the administration side of the business. So that's how I kind of got into it. I thought the idea was great. Uh, she had a clear, um, set of artists that she wanted to promote. And, uh, I thought the idea was great. And that's how I started essentially. Now, after some years working with street artists in Spain, um, it clearly, uh, became to me that it was still as hard as it was with my father back in the eighties, because we were having a really hard time selling artworks between 2000 and 2,500 euros. We would have some of Spain's best art collectors on paper, of course, ultra high net worth individuals come in and say, well, this is lovely. You know, what you're ha- what you have here is great. And again, we have, um, documentation to support this because we had over two months of school buses come into the ga- gallery to see these street artists at the time. And so this this collector came in and said, hey, I, I would like a discount. And we said, well, listen, I mean, we're sorry, but we're starting and the, the the prices that we're putting here are really kind of like, you know, yeah. they're, they're the lowest it could get. I said, okay, fine. So I'm not buying. No. Oh. So that's, that's how it was at the time. And it was continuously like that. So street art today is something that is extremely popular, but it hasn't always been that popular. And the only reason why it's now popular is because the generation that grew up with graffiti, seeing graffiti and, and, and thinking there was art in that graffiti are essentially coming up to a point in their time where uh, they're grown ups and they have, they have capital to deploy and, and they could, they could make a meaningful contribution to the, um, to this discipline, you know? So yeah, anyway, um, the gallery didn't go as great as we thought it would, uh, because of the market. And that's when I decided to become an independent advisor and be instead of on the sell side, on the buy side and try to provide clients, um, a good informed opinion on, you know, where things were going in aesthetic um, and economic financial terms. Okay. 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 So what would be the um, requirements Mm -hmm. to understand, analyze, and evaluate art? Well, the requirements I would say is spending a lot of time looking at art. A lot. So... I always try to give this analogy, you know, when to people understand how art works 
and I, I take it to, to football. You know, how do you recognize a great Real Madrid Barcelona game? Well, you can only really tell after having seen 20 years of football, great football mm -hmm. matches, you know, league, Champions Leagues, um, you know, World Cups, you name it, whatever. That's when, you know, after l seeing a lot of games, you you could really tell where the magic is. And, and it's a really, they're really fine things here and there that you could only um, appreciate in a, in a football game um, that comes with experience of seeing things, you know? And art is exactly the same thing. I think it's true for everything, I would say. I mean, your experience in music, again, is probably mm -hmm. the same, right? I mean, how could you tell a great guitar player? Um, I mean, you can only tell after having listening to a lot of guitar players. And Absolutely. A lot of, and also if it speaks to you, if it touches your soul. True, true, of course, of course. But, you know, I would say there are some things that touch your soul when you're an apprentice of a discipline. Yes. And there are complete different things that touch your soul after you're a master. Definitely, yes. And I think that, and I'm more interested in what touches your soul when you've you've you're you've master. mastered the 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 discipline what from a critique be? perspective. Is it technique? Is it the idea, the concept, originality, authenticity? What is it? It's a bit of everything. Um, we're 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 in a very interesting um, world. Um, referring to the art world. Okay. Because um, what we see today in, from, in, in the art world from, is essentially, essentially comes from the deconstruction of the image after we discovered the camera. I think it's important to say at this stage that every single great um, artistic art movement or, 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 or generational leap comes from um, the evolution of society and, and that has uh, a great factor into that evolution is, is technology. So when the, the first um, camera uh, was discovered and people started taking photos, well, the whole idea of painting um, representationally lost its purpose because people essentially painted reality because there wasn't another way of mm -hmm. representing reality. There wasn't a camera. So when that came true in the um, 19th century, um, all of these artists, all these incredible artists, well, they decided, well, what's the purpose of photography? Yeah, what's, what's the, I'm sorry, what's the purpose of painting, painting. Yeah, after yeah. photography? You know, what, what are we supposed to do? So that's when the image started to deconstruct. That's when impressionists mm. started coming to place. They started to bring in their impressions of the image instead of bringing an image. Uh, then came the post-impressionists, which are essentially not only impressions, but emotions. Um, then there's modernists who started thinking, okay, let's, you know, cubism. So let's represent from a very um, synthetical, synthetical perspective. So, you know, so all of what we've seen from the 19th century onwards is essentially a fight, a battle against the image and theorizing on where does art go beyond the, the image. And that took us all the way to non-representational art, abstraction and conceptual art, which I would say the peak is probably 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Um, and then after that, we come to a place where um, some theorists, great theorists, great art critics, uh, such as Arthur C. Danto says, well, once you've kind of gotten to the finite, the mm -hmm. finite of infinity, I would say, what's next in the art world? You know, because we've gone from representational, which had been the 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 aesthetic means, the finest aesthetic means that humanity had to represent art since ancient Egypt or even, even since the cavemans all the way to 19th century. So, you know, you have a long period of time where it's only about representational. 
now we're able to understand that we don't need to represent, that we could go beyond that. And you go to the point where conceptualism is something really important. And conceptualism, conceptualism is essentially, um, you know, um, a banana, a banana stuck to uh, a wall with some tape, um, <laughs> like we saw, yeah. you know, in an art fair. That's, that's conceptualism. It's, it's an idea. It's not an artwork. It's not the odd. It's it's not about the object. It's about the meaning and the message and the approach the artist has with that object. And so there, it's a lot more about uh, literature and and mm -hmm. and aesthetic essays, which is fine. It's great, but there's there's I would say there's a limit to that. I mean, once you get into that, I mean, of course, it's there's no limit. But I would say, okay, fine. What's what's after that? You know, there needs yeah. to be a point where the next generation tries to kill the previous generation in order to kill in 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 a in a Freudian perspective. You know, you need to kill the 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 ideas. Otherwise, there's no evolution. So the next generation needs to come into place and question what has been doing. Um, all this time. And Arthur C. Danto, what he says is, um, and I think he said this in what's the title of the book. It's called The End of the End of Art. Maybe you could look it up. Arthur C. Danto. Yeah. Okay. So what he basically says is, um, once we've got, gotten to that limit where there's really not much more to discover in in aesthetic terms, and by aesthetic terms we mean by visual philosophy. That's mm -hmm. what aesthetic means in, in our world. Once you've gotten to that point, you have freedom because there aren't any more battles to fight. There, there aren't any more uh, conceptual battles or, or political battles to be fought within art. So you really essentially have the freedom to do whatever you want. And that's what essentially what we're seeing right now. Um, so it's we're living in a in a time where that battle is currently taking place because the previous generation is still alive and they're still doing a lot of postmodern contemporary art that is heavily linked to all these philosophical ideas of the 60s 70s and early 80s which is you know very radical ideas i would say this this essentially comes from uh french um postmodern philosophy, you know, these uh, structuralists like Foucault and so forth. So this is still in place. And but there's also another truth, which is essentially my generation, the millennial generation with which has grown up with video games, seeing street art, graffiti, um, very close to pop culture, having, you know, TV in, in our room and having access to MTV you name it, whatever it was, you know, that we, we had, you know, and, and that generation is coming to into place right now to in a position where they're in their late twenties or thirties or even, uh, early forties. And they have something to say about what they think art is. And so right now there's kind of like this battle, these, these, I wouldn't say a battle, but it's a very interesting moment in time because, mm -hmm for the first time, I would say in a hundred years, um, there is a political freedom that there didn't exist before. And that is allowing us to see a different art, different generation of art. And this is, um, I think extremely helpful and because it will help people understand perhaps with more, uh, how can I say perspective, um, also the quality of all that deconstruction of art for the past 100 years, which has kept people kind of looking at themselves for a long time saying, what is really art, you know? Exactly. That's the question. And how does that impact evaluating art and where do you draw the line? <sighs> it's a great question. Um, first of all, you need to, again, you have to have, uh, you have to see a lot of art, but you also have to ed educate yourself a little bit and you have to know about art history and know about art history means knowing about, you know, essentially how these art movements were created, how they evolved and knowing what pushed them to go to the next level. Once you understand that, you need to kind of look into things and say, okay, who who's here now and 
who's creating this and who's creating that and what's going on. And who are the interesting people in today's world that are looking into these artists? And so, um, yo, I think that if, if you want to have a great idea, you have to go to the top art galleries, um, or at least galleries that go to quality fair. So there, there's, there's a great art fair right now taking place, um, in Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi art fair. Um, it's a great way of getting to understand what the current, um, mood of, of art is. And I think that pretty much most of what you see there is, you know, is fine art. And that's already something that is extraordinary because there's also a lot of people that because there's this um, false idea that anything could be art. They start creating things that have no aesthetic quality or purpose or no, or do not bring anything new to the table that are just creating, creating, creating. And they're just bringing, and, and people who don't know about art think that, well, you know, because I don't understand too much art and this guy is so-called artist, then maybe this is art. So, so that you, you need to kind of look into, I would say the institutions, you know, you need to go to quality art fairs. You need to go to art galleries. You need to go to museums because behind all of these institutions or businesses, you have very highly qualified people who understand art history and who understand what the current world looks like they will all have different views and visions, but that's why it's really important to go to see a lot of art galleries and a lot of museums and travel all over the world to form your own opinion. Mm -hmm. But it's really important that people start going to, I would say, first of all, to museums, start by the old stuff per mm -hmm. se, the old regime, and then progressively move forward into modernism. So late 19th century, early 20th century and then push it to post-war, you know, that would be Andy Warhol. Um, and then push it to, you know, post-modernism. There would be Basquiat there, Jeff Koons, um, Damien Hirst, um, some of, you know, the greatest artists of, of our time. And once you've seen all of that, then you start going to art galleries. That's the way. And, and you start asking questions and you look at things and you say, hey, and how does this, you know, how is what I'm seeing relevant to today's uh, aesthetic framework? What's, what's the added value? What's the artist's intent? Um, how is he painting this? Is, is how he painting or, or elaborating these works in any shape or form uh, relevant or, or is it a feature in itself or, you know, and so forth. So it's all about, um, going back to, um, museums, galleries, and just, yeah, asking questions. What about, um, purpose and art? Perfect. Does an artwork have to have a purpose? Does it have to? Um, the short answer would be no. Okay. Okay. No, it doesn't, but it could. Uh huh. And I think it should. And would that make it more valuable? A purpose. Uh, I mean, I, I I remember this 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 show. I'm going kind of diverting. Um, I remember this show, this Top Gear show with yeah. Jeremy Clarkson uh, driving an Alfa Romeo 8C. Competitiana, which is a very beautiful car. It's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's stunning. And he said it was a work of art. And mm -hmm. But then he drove it and, and he realized it was, I don't know if I could It's not curse practical. Here. Yeah, it's Let's, the worst, the, mm, okay. great, but terrible hard to, uh, car to handle. Um, so when he, f he was finishing his review, he was saying that he had talked to, um, I think it was the head curator or curator of the, Tate Modern or Tate National Museum in, in the UK. And, and he was saying, so, you know, and Jeremy was talking about uh, this conversation about art and he said, so what is art? And, uh, you know, does, does, and, and essentially what this curator was saying is, listen, art um, doesn't have, you know, can't have a functionality. 
Mm-hmm. So it, it's essentially something that you just hang on the wall and you just look at and it doesn't have any functionality at all. So in a certain sense, it doesn't have any purpose, I would say, right? If it doesn't have any functionality. Anyway, that's that could be another debate. But but the end, the, the, the way he finishes the review is this is not an, an, a car. This is an artwork to look at. This is something that you just look at, you just admire because it has no functionality. It has no, to a certain extent, some purpose, you know, of existing other than being looked at. Okay. So that is a view. That is one view in the art world, but there's also the view of, you know, having the purpose of bringing light to the current context. Um, I think that it's, you know, artists to a certain extent, I would say are incredible mediums of their time. They're very sensitive people and they absorb a lot of information from today's society from a political, economic, social perspective, geopolitical perspective, which is having a tremendous impact on them. And they believe that just as it's having a great impact on them, it's also having great impact on society. And their work essentially tries to evolve, revolve around these ideas. And they try to create something that has some sort of purpose to solve these issues from an aesthetic emotional perspective, right? So in a way, the real purpose of art, I would say, is art is a time capsule. They're they're pictures that tell a very meaningful reality of what society was at a determined point, moment in time from an objective perspective, then we could get into, you know, how uh, that could be, I would say, uh, interpreted. But the reality is whatever they're doing there and then is essentially a a good summary of um, something that was going on at the time. And it's really our job as, you know, art advisor, whether you're an art advisor like me, or you're an art curator or director of a museum or an art collector to determine Mm -hmm. what that is. And, and, um, once you have that and you're capable of living with all these different perspectives of realities, then your life really changes because it enhances your vision of the world. It does indeed. It does indeed. Absolutely. I agree. It's a window on a specific moment in time. And sometimes it's a, a more honest um, representation because we know sometimes in the media we don't get the right side of the truth. Sure. Though it's still an objective one from the artist's perspective, but yeah, probably it's not that much manipulated. Mm-hmm. I would say the difference between the media and the artist is the intent. Okay. You know, Good point. Please elaborate. <laughs> I don't know to which extent media is always always has good intent. Okay. Whereas artists, I would say, do. Uh, whether you like their intent or not, but they always try to create the most of the most of what they feel and see. They they part from a really good position. Um. So you may not, you know, I, I'm always very skeptical of everything that I see, no matter where it comes from, but there's always a lot more, there's better intent, I would say, better intent from, from the artist's per- perspective than from the media world. And not to, you know, not to say that you shouldn't go into into looking at media and and so forth, but you, because I really I'm a believer that the most you see, no matter where it comes from, you need to the better off you're going to be, and the more you're going to be able to form an opinion, a, a quality opinion. Um, but artists really bring that capacity, that media, not necessarily because you don't know who really is behind the news, whether. You know, it's a foreign country that is manipulating the input from that media outlet or the shareholder from the media company or whatever. You know, you could, there there are a lot of 
pieces behind media outlets that could question you, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the truthfulness, the objectiveness of the, of not to say that it's, oh, that it's always like that, but with artists, I would say is the complete opposite, mm -hmm. you know, they're always going to give the best out of themselves. They're not, they're not necessarily, um, cynical. There's something that art isn't is, is cynical, I would say. That's powerful. Okay. What's your, what's your take on digital art? Well, it's, it's, it's something, it's fundamental. Um, uh, but when digital art was starting right after COVID with NFTs, well, first of all, NFTs had already been, um, created previously. Um, you know, I think it was the first, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, Maybe I'm wrong, but I think maybe it was like 2016 or 17 that maybe the first NFT was minted. Not sure. Honestly, digital art has been there for sure for a long time, I think. Digital art started in the late 90s, um, and it has been there for a long time. Um, my, 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 my stand on, on digital art is... There are some great things, but not everything because it's digital art. Not not everything that is digital and looks like art mm -hmm. is necessarily art, hence digital art. Okay. Okay. So, so, you know, the NFTs, let's put it this way. NFTs, what is NFT? When you get really down to it, an NFT is a medium. Mm -hmm. It's a canvas. That's what it is. It's nothing more. No matter how many people you put to work on a canvas, I could almost guarantee that only 1% or less than 1% will come with something meaningful and good that could be determined as art. Less than, yeah, less than 1%, I would say, mm -hmm. far less. Um, with NFTs, it's the exact same thing. NFT is just a medium like an old canvas. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a digital structure, it's a framework. Not because you provide a content to a digital structure, you're giving it aesthetic substance. So the whole, the, my whole point is that we have seen a lot of emergence of people who started minting NFTs. And because of the novelty of the medium, everybody thought that they were creating an artwork. But again, if everybody is an artist, nobody's an artist, right? Indeed. Like if, 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 if everything is art, nothing is art. Yeah. Right. Scarcity it, gives it value also. Uh, I mean, more than scarcity, it's, it's the ideas, you know? I mean, what's the whole point of just sticking a, an image, like minting, you know, stick an image to a, a minted NFT and give it scarcity if the image itself is worthless. Makes sense. Yeah. You know, how, how is that meaningful to... So, I mean, it could be meaningful to you, but the whole idea of art with a capital A is that it has to be universal. Mm -hmm. So if it's meaningful to you, but it's not meaningful to the rest of the world, then it's not art. Okay. Yeah. Since we spoke about NFTs, yeah. I can't help talking about regulations, not only in digital art, but in art in general with the capital A because it's a great storage of value, mm -hmm. but it's non-regulated. Uh, I mean, yes, it is regulated. I mean, okay. my, my industry, so for example, I'm not, I, I'm not regulated as an advisor. Nobody mm -hmm. really is except in the US, I would say. Uh, in order to be technically called an art advisor, mm -hmm. In the U.S., you need to be part of uh, the Art Advisory uh, Association, but really, you don't have to be part of that association to be label yourself as an art advisor. So, the sheer fact that nobody, there's no law that requires any professional substance to your um, professional name. Uh, means that anybody could really get into this, which of course it's, is, is always, you know, a kind of, you know, it's dangerous again, mm -hmm. because then you have a world where a lot of people, so-called advisors go out there, 
They represent things that they cannot represent. They sell things that they cannot sell. They take commissions that are out of the ordinary because essentially they're making use of uh, a, a label which essentially says uh, advisor and advising means having the client's interest at heart. heart. Of course. Of course, and having your interest aligned with the client. And they use that to essentially, uh, you know, take advantage of the client instead of working for the client. So some of these so-called art advisors are really art dealers or brokers, which they're great. I mean, no problem whatsoever, but full disclosure, if you're not going to be advising and having your clients at heart, then you should tell your client, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a broker. I'm a dealer. I'm not interested in, in your interest. I'm interested in my interest. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you don't see. That being said, there are certain limits um, regulation wise in the U S and Europe. Um, but still there are a lot of things that need to be worked out. Um, you can't sell fakes, mm -hmm. you know, in the art world, uh, you cannot, uh, re you cannot misrepresent things. You cannot rep misrepresent provenance, um, authorship, uh, exhibition history and so forth, because that could get you into a lot of trouble. Okay. So if you sell a painting, say in the one to, you know, starting north of $1 million in the U S mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of regulation that uh, needs to be looked at when you're um, representing what you're selling, because if you represent what you're not supposed to, um, you could go to jail. Okay. Okay. It's not as tough in Europe. Um, but you know, mm, you have to be very careful. You have to be extraordinarily careful. And that being said, there aren't that very many people that fraudsters, fraudulent people out there. It's just that when you see one, you hear a lot about them and that creates a huge impact in society and people then look at us and say, oh, what's going on in the art world, blah, blah, blah because it's a very juicy world. You know, it's a world where it's full of mystery. You know, you have all these billionaires getting in and you have these billionaire galleries selling highly coveted artists, which have such a limited output and they sell for millions, you know? And, and so people look at this, you know, with this mystique, um, which, which attracts and also unattracts people. Some people love it and get into the art, try to get into the art world for this, mystique and, mm -hmm. and try to take advantage of it because they create this misconception of the art world based on those, um, on that description. But you also have the people who hate it, the populace, I would say, and start, you know, banalizing what the art world really is and say, well, it's full of, you know, um, fraudsters and, and okay. sketchy people. But the truth is none of those two polls are true. Most of the art world, I would say, on a, on a daily basis is extremely boring <laughs> on a daily basis. Then it gets to, you know, you go to an art fair and you meet an artist and you meet a gallerist and, and you go for some drinks and you go to for lunch and you start talking and discussing. That's when it gets really fun. Okay. That's when, you know, then what, that's when art is the excuse to have fun. And that's what people, I think that's what our clients have discovered the most through art. You know, it's not only about those purposeful images, pictures that they're hanging on the walls that give you like an emotional stability that you need in your house. It's also about that lifestyle that you get from buying those artworks, you know, because then you're invited to the VIP day on this fair and that fair. You might be even invited to the hotel. You might even get plane tickets if you're a good enough client. Mm -hmm. You might be invited to these really exclusive dinners at the Ritz, you know, and you're having dinner with extraordinarily people, extraordinary people. And, you know, the, the people that you're sitting in some of these tables are really powerful people that you would normally not meet in any other circumstance. And the fact that you're there sitting really relaxed, having a, you know, a great drink and meal is, is, is in itself, uh, inviting to have, 
these conversations that go beyond the professional realm. So you're starting to talk about, you know, so what do you do for a living? When you have a family, do you not have a family? Where do you live? Um, how did you get into the art world? Is there anything that you liked? And you have, you start having these conversations with, which build um, incredible connections. And you start having this international network of really interesting people, mm -hmm. to say the least. Yeah. Which, after a while, makes your life so much more interesting. You know? That's a super reason for people to invest in art. Yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons why people invest in art, I would say, because after, once they buy, they receive this social return mm -hmm. on investment, you know, which means be sitting on the table with some of these really interesting folks, which is great. I, I can't say whom, but I've been to some dinners in the past two, three months with incredible people, which you just want to invite home and hang out with for the rest of the days because wow. it's just, yeah, it's really, really great. And the fact that they're also great professionals in their world and, and exceptional, um, and what they do just makes it even more interesting, you know, because not, it's not only about the ideas that you're hearing, but it's also seeing their positions like, wow, you know, this, this person, if they've come to that position, it means that all of what they're bringing onto the table really has some relevance and importance and, and being part of that in this moment of time where, you know, you could sit and have these meaningful conversations, it's just incredible, incredible. It is indeed. And what other aspects would there be to invest in art apart from the social status? Oh, there's, there's obviously the economic and financial, okay. um, obviously, but, um, I would say the, the, in my view, the best investors are the finest collectors, which means you, you're not getting into it for the money. Mm -hmm. You're getting it, you're, you're going into it for, for pleasure, for emotional, aesthetic, um, value. Or the love of art. For the love of art. Um, if you're a collector, it means you have your, normally speaking, if you're labeled as a collector, it means you have, uh, an, an informed decision capacity, which makes it easy to filter through the art world and you're capable of buying fine art with a capital A instead of whatever. So if you're, if you're, you're a fine art collector and you're doing this for the love of art, the chances are that you will come, um, to a point where you've accumulated a decent amount of very valuable artworks. And if you're that kind of person, you're not going to want to sell it because you have a connection to those artworks because they have a lot of value, not only universal, but also to you. I hear you, yes, absolutely. And so once you get to that point, you're holding the artwork, you're holding it because you don't want to sell it. You just want to have it at home, take care of it, maybe share it with your friends, perhaps take it to a museum or a show here and there. Um, you'll, you'll try to uh, open up your house as much as possible during art fairs for people to come, you'll communicate. And then it gets to a point where people start understanding the whole value of this. But for that to happen, you obviously need time. So if you want to make great investments in art, you need to look at it from a long-term perspective. This is like, you know, um, people who invest in bonds versus people who invest in Tesla, you know. The institutional money is on the bond, on the bond side, not on mm. investing yeah. in, in, in Tesla. Of course, there are huge institutional investors that put money into Tesla and Apple and all of these. But um, I hear from what I hear from the experts that I think have something to say on this, the bond market is really where the intelligent investor mm -hmm. lies. And art is in a, from a pers you know, from a time perspective, more closely linked to bonds than to, you know, speculative yeah. or short-term 
um, equities. And if you if you understand this, this is fine. You could you could buy art as your pension fund and say, hey, you know, maybe thirty years down the line after having this great artwork, or not thirty, but twenty fifty, twenty fifteen, mm-hmm. um, maybe you know, I could I could sell this make a good decent amount of money for my retirement um which is which is fine um but if you're buying now to hold for like one two years and then resell it i mean you're gonna get in trouble because um the art industry doesn't really like that um Mm. generally speaking at when we're talking about really great artists um uh the 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 structure is as follows. It's very few artists, very, very few artists, contemporary artists, meaningful contemporary artists, producing very few artworks, maybe 10, 20 artworks per year. And the waiting lists for these artists are incredible, which means that the primary market price is substantially lower than the secondary market price. So some of these artworks would sell for 100,000 at a gallery. And at auction, they sell maybe 200, 300, 400, 500,000. Why is that? So because demand is far greater than the offer. So you would say, why don't galleries sell the art at auction and make an extra profit? Well, because they're trying to place the artworks in meaningful places that give value to the art that they're buying. So the, the buyer itself has to bring value to the artwork for the gallery to be interested in selling that artwork. So what is in your collection? Um, what's your vision? Where's your collection going? Do you have a museum? Do you, are you considering, you know, uh, loaning to a museum? Are you considering donating to a museum? How, how are you, you know, galleries ask you, what's your contribution to this artist? Because if you're in it for the money, who cares for them? They, mm-hmm. they have 250 plus people waiting list okay. that have money, you know. Well, what, what kind of contribution would the buyer bring to the artist? Well, it's, it's a good one. But first of all, uh, the, the, the buyer needs to have a clear vision of what that artist is and how he's gonna, you know, accompany that artist with other meaningful artists creating synergy. So artist number one, you know, gives value to artist number two, numbers, num, artist number two gives value to artist number one and so forth. Okay. So it's, so, I mean, you're probably not going to be granted access immediately if you're starting your first artwork to some of these really highly cherished artworks, but you could start buying certain things, taking a risk, obviously, um, because otherwise it wouldn't have the price mm-hmm. tag that it has. You know, if you're going to buy a great artwork at 10,000, I mean, if you're buying it at 10,000, it doesn't mean, you know, that it's it's ultra validated because if True. it was ultra validated, it wouldn't be at 10,000. You know, I mean, 10,000 is kind of like an, an, an entry level sort of way. So you have to kind of start looking into the art world and saying, okay, let's, let's start building a substantial collection. But mm-hmm. with some of these names that, people generally don't have in their, in their mindset. So you probably build your collection with those, which is relatively easy. And once you start having that meaningful collection and people understand that you're not in it for the money, then you go to these galleries and you say, Hey, I'm interested in buying this $100,000 artwork or $200,000 artworks or $300,000 artworks. Would you grant me access? And they'll say, well, well, what do you have in your collection? And you'll say, well, I have this. And they'll say, oh, well, surprisingly, we like what you have. We think you're a good candidate. And with, of course, the help of an advisor, um, it'll it'll help breach that gap because essentially if you're just going into that gallery and calling them, you're not getting any access. But if, if we call, um, we're giving our clients the benefit, the added value that we've done that yeah. with other clients. So if we are willing to put our name into that request, galleries know that if we're doing that, it's it's because the 
there isn't any risk of, because otherwise if there is, if that happens, if the guy tends, ends up buying and reselling to flip, then I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. And we all know that in the industry, the gallery knows that I know that. So we all keep, and you know, we're, we're all pretty. That's very, very interesting dynamic. Yeah. Nobody says about it. Nobody talks about that, but we all know about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for shedding a light on it. Yeah, sure. And what about the art scene or should I say the industry? in uh, United Arab Emirates, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. Oh, it's great. It's extraordinary. Okay. I think it's far greater than what people think. Um, um, we're still missing a museum, I would say, in Dubai. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's a plan. Okay. It seems like there's a plan, a museum of fine art. I think there should be some, I mean, well, there is, there's the Jamil Art Center, I'm sorry, yes. which is great. Yeah. It's actually great. Um, but I would say um, more more like the Jamil Center we need, you mm -hmm. know, it doesn't have to be like the Louvre Abu Dhabi, but something like that, because my feeling is that there are great collectors in the region. And I know this for a fact because I store our artworks uh, along other artworks. And when I see the amount of artworks in storage, yeah, I realize that, you know, there are plenty, plenty art buyers in the region. Um, I just think that what the you know, one of the things that were missing at the time right now is a place for these collectors to showcase what they're currently buying and make a contribution to society because all of these collectors have been buying for a long time uh, from great artists in the region. Um, you have you have great Middle Eastern artists. I'm not a huge expert, but you know there's uh, some artists that we've been following, like Farah Al Kasimi, uh, uh, Maisa Abdala, also a great artist. Um, there is, um, uh, and I may mispronounce this, Sara Al Daheri. Al Daheri um, works with Carbon Twelve, great gallery. Also, Call has great galleries as well. Uh, there's some. Yeah, I would say El Circle is probably the best place to go to see you know, what's cooking in the region. Uh, the fairs, Art Abu Dhabi is, Abu Dhabi Art Fair is an yeah. incredible fair right now to go and discover. Dubai Art Fair is also a great place to go. Um, there is a lot of very meaningful and great contributions from local artists in the international scene. Um, and I'm missing a lot of artists, by the way. I mean, it's... Giving, I've given you three names. Uh, I won't give you more because even though I know who they are, I think I'm just probably going to kill their name by pronouncing it. So I'd rather not <laughs> at the time. But there is, there's, the, there's a lot going on in the Middle East. And I think part of that comes from uh, the interesting geopolitical situation of the Middle East and how it's in the crossroads of Europe and Asia mm -hmm. and Africa as well. So if... if um, and collectors know this, uh, you know, very recently in, uh, I mean, just yesterday on Abu Dhabi Art Fair, I was meeting with a colleague, an art advisor from New York, who represents some of, you know, New York's top collectors. And she was here looking, you know, her collector said, hey, go to Abu Dhabi Art Fair and tell me what's cooking, you know? So a lot of people are looking into what's happening here right now, because to a certain extent, we're seeing here in Dubai what we saw, or at least what I felt in New York back in the 80s, you know, we mm -hmm. felt that um, energy, that forward looking um, vision, the the outlook, the future. Uh, you know, one thing that we love about the UAE is how rich the present is in terms of outlook. Okay. You know, there is, there is faith in the future here. Uh, there is faith in the progress and where, where things are going. We feel like, and this is something that a lot of my colleagues and, and, you know, European friends and American friends will say, you know, some of the things that we're seeing in Europe and the U.S. are really heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, it just gives you a very... I say this, you know, the, the, the future isn't great over there at the yeah. moment. 
And whereas here, uh, there is there is there is wealth, there is um, great migration flows that are enriching the region. The networks that are being created are extraordinary. The policies are just incredible for 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 growth. Um, and the basic ingredients for for a great country for the next 20, 30, 40, 50, you know, 100 years are here right now. And I don't think there are a lot of places in the world that could say that at the moment. That is a great truth. As an art in capital A. Yeah. <laughs> now we'll come to a point in the show where we're going to ask you about your favorites, your eight favorite things. Okay. Let's do that in a rapid fire way. Okay. Eight favorite things. Okay. Let me... Let's see if I could do that. Okay, go ahead. One, Shoot. two, three. Okay. I'm not good at numbers. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Number one, what's your favorite dish? Okay. Uh, I have to say it in Spanish, tortilla de patata, which is essentially Spanish omelet. Uh, okay. Basic ingredients, eggs, eggs, uh, potatoes, onions, and uh, olive oil and salt. That's it. Really basic, but you need to know how to master the ingredients and the order of the ingredients at the time, at each time, but it's my favorite. Perfection in simplicity. Yes, yes. There you go. Yes. And are you a good cook? Pretty good, yeah, I would say, yeah. Okay. I think I am. Stomach. I mean, okay. yeah. I'm hungry. Yeah, hungry? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a good cook. Yeah, you'll come home and try some of the things that I pre prepare. Would love to, with pleasure. Yeah. Question number two. Okay. What's your favorite band or artist favorite band or artist um being spanish um i'm gonna have to say julio iglesias he's great but i mean they're also they're also great uh alejandro sanz is also great he's amazing uh, he's also yeah. great great yeah um can i see another one maybe perhaps yeah juan luis guerra also great mm. yeah do you know venezuelan no oh listen to him okay we'll yeah. do yeah cool What's your favorite movie or TV series? Or both? TV series Breaking Bad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. It's great. Movie? Mm. How about the score? Okay, okay, okay. Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan, I think. Okay. I think it's a great movie. Also very contemporary. Indeed. indeed. I thought maybe you'd come up with some artsy movie. Um, the that being said, the Warhol Netflix series is great. It's okay. ex extraordinary. People I'll should watch it. That. Yeah, I have not. Okay, what's your favorite book? Oof, uh, it's interesting. It's a science fiction book that I read when I was in my teens. It's called La Nuit des Temps. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the the, the night, night of the times, time. yeah, from Barjavel. So, uh, and it basically um, talks about uh, how these uh, scientists, and I think it was in Tartaria, discovered a like a golden capsule, which mm -hmm. they thought was, which was from the past, obviously, but it came to be like this really, um, like an alien kind of thing Ooh. from that was more advanced than anything that we have seen until then. And it just gave me like this incredible perspective of how. Maybe some things from the past could be better than what we see in the present times. Also, El Quixote is great. Yeah, Don El Quixote, Quixote. It, it, it gives you, it's it's a great way. I think that people need to read El Quixote today to un understand the insanity that we're going, that we're seeing in the world right now. True. Yeah. Great way. Okay. What's your favorite animal? My dog. Mm. Mart Martina. Martina. Martina, yeah. What breed is she? A chihuahua. Three kilo chihuahua, which is great. She's extraordinary. And she's cool. a heartbreaker as well. I mean, anybody that meets her is like, wants to be with Martina. She's, you know, when we're um, back at home, we have our, my parents and my wife's parents, they're, they're, they kill to have her when we leave. She's like, yeah, can we have Martina for a couple of days? It's like, <laughs> everybody wants to have her. She's great. Martina wins. Yeah. She's the boss. She is. Oh, okay. absolutely. Hands down. Okay. A very difficult question. Okay, go ahead. Who's your favorite painter? Painter or artist? Okay, painter slash artist. 
You can choose a few. I know. Uh, Got to take it. It's easy. hard. It's really hard because I, know, I have I, I have a lot of favorites. Um, but after we were recently in Paris and went to see the um, Rotko retrospective show at the Louis Vuitton Foundation, incredible. Yeah, people have to go and see Rotko in Paris to understand the quality. But there's also from that same time, Jackson Pollock is one of amongst my favorite. One is I would say more intellectual and thoughtful and brainy. Either that that would be Rotko, and then the other one would be more kind of uh, ego driven, okay. spontaneous, no, spontaneous, a wild, crazy, but great and genius. And another perspective that would be Pollock. Those those two are for me phenomenal. The, the classics, the classics. Um. John Bruegel, John Bruegel is extraordinary. There's, um, just went to see some John Bruegel at the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. That is mm -hmm. incredible. There is a depiction of nat nature landscape full of animals and just looking at them is great because they would, he would paint animals with, um, personality with, with human faces, mm -hmm. traits. So it's it's like this really magic artwork where we start looking at it. Oh, you see here a lion, you see a duck, a, a dog, wow. but they all have human characteristics, and and there's 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 a lot going on there, and it's beautiful also, you know, right? We go and check it out. Yeah, but yeah, Picasso. Mm. He's an, well, he's not an old master, but Rembrandt. Uh, El Greco. El Greco oh, yeah. was the first uh, impressionist, expressionist artist uh, in figuration. So the first post-impressionist, I would say, Greco is extraordinary. Um, I was recently at uh, Stockholm. Okay. And I went to the National Museum to sell some Rembrandts and Rembrandt. uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. And they had a couple of Monets as well. And incredible. Impressive. Impressive. Yeah. Monet's is also yeah. incredible. Yeah. And uh, the Louvre Abu Dhabi recently did um, a show on the Ecole de Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was greatly curated. The museology at the Louvre in Abu Dhabi is just incredible. It's, it's okay. and I would say, one of amongst the best in the world. And they had um, videos, 19th century videos of Monet painting in his 90s. Ooh. I'm sorry. And he's, I think he was already... Um, it was already the 20th century, early 20th century when he was in his 90s, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, but you could see, bottom line, you could see videos of him painting uh, when he was 90 year old. Um, and it's just incredible, incredible to see that. Okay. Yeah. Our seventh question. Okay. Who is your role model? My role model? Yep. Okay. I'm going to have to... My role model, I would say, um, and I have to elaborate this, uh, okay. but the short answer is Fernando Alonso. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say the reason why a, he is a role model is because he's been persistently great, technically magnificent for 20 years in a sport that is looking at tens of seconds. So in order to master that, you know, even after, and I'm, I'm a racing driver myself. I race at the cart wow. drone. So, yes, sir. so, Didn't and, know and, that. and, and it, and it, it actually helps me tremendously in my mental sanity because it, it, once you're in the car, you can't think about anything except that corner, that apex. Mm -hmm. You need to feel the cart. You need to feel the rear end, the front end. You need to, be smooth, can't break the balance. You need to see it, you know, who's behind you, who's in front and see the rhythm. So you need to be extremely aware of the environment in a very um, challenging environment. Yeah. And so that, that, that awareness, that obligation to have that awareness helps you, you know, focus, focus. and that focus is just great for, for your, for your own mental health. Amazing. And, so again, having that experience and seeing somebody like him be consistently that great driver, 
um, makes me think, you know, has for me is it's somebody that I, that I look up to and say, I need to have that sort of persistence and constance in my life. Wonderful. Yeah. I had the privilege of meeting him, spending some time with him Okay. when I was working for a Spanish company that used to sponsor okay. Fernando Alonso. Okay. Yeah. So yes, he's an idol, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And great yeah. inspiration. Yeah. He's also, he comes from the same region I come from in Spain, from Asturias. Yeah. And okay. he actually, yeah, he actually bikes, he, uh, yeah, he goes for bike tracks that are not far from our house in Asturias and Amazing. funny enough, we have like these common places and Anyway, and by the way, his talking about art and museums, uh, people should go to his museum. Mm -hmm. It is an extraordinary museum that is in the north of Spain in Asturias and has every single car that he's driven in, in that wow. complex. And it's, and the helmets from every single driver that he's met and suits and it's incredible. It's great. We'll do a visit on my yeah. next trip to Spain. Absolutely. You should. Yeah. Spain is home, as you know, as yeah, well. Yeah. Okay. We come to our last question. Oh, okay. There's still one more. Okay. Just the eighth. Okay. Eight. Yeah. There you go. What is your favorite city? Madrid. Hmm. Okay. Madrid is my favorite city. Good. I think, yeah, I have to say Madrid. It's <laughs> perfect balance between cultural, culture, lifestyle, um, you name it, everything is there. It's probably not, I mean, there's some beautiful things in Madrid, beautiful. Great museums. Great museums, probably not the most beautiful city in the world, but the people um, and and the lifestyle, the fun, the oh. the atmosphere is just incredible. I, I've traveled all over the world. There are, some, there are some things I love about a lot of places. You know, I love New York, I love Paris, I love London, Berlin. Dubai, of course. I mean, Abu Dhabi. Just yesterday, my wife was telling me, hey, you know, this place, Abu Dhabi, is just incredible. And we live in Dubai. Mm. We love Dubai. We love Abu Dhabi. But Madrid, um, it's just perfect balance. Food, drinks, people, conversations, things to see. And Real Madrid is there. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so not to get controversial, but yeah. Viva España. Viva España. Let's yeah. keep it at yeah, that. Absolutely. Cristobal Galicia, I cannot thank you enough. Please. But I would definitely would want to have you on the show in the future. Sure, absolutely. We'll have a follow-up and uh, probably we'll have the session in Spanish next time. Oh, really? Sure. De acuerdo, yeah. si quieres. Sí, por supuesto. Claro que sí. Lo vamos a hacer. Let's do it. Let's do that. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. You take care. Hello. Inner's community. Hope you enjoyed this session. We'd like to know your comments and thoughts. Most importantly, please do share the episodes and the micro content. The purpose of this podcast is to exchange experiences and share knowledge and raise awareness. So be part of the change. Create your waves. Let the ripple effect reach to everyone, where all of good action comes full circle. And please do remember to hit the like button and the subscribe button, and I'll see you next session.